Well, good evening and welcome to St. David's School and this second speaker series event of the 2020-21 school year. Uh, we are just thrilled and honored this evening to have with us uh, Dr. Kevin Gus Guskowitz, uh, the Chancellor of uh, UNC Chapel Hill. So welcome to you, uh, Chancellor Guskowitz, and uh, thank you for being here. And we uh, welcome, uh, want to welcome as well each of you, especially uh, our current students and uh, St. David's alumni that are joining us and guests of the school. Um, we're grateful to be gathered here this evening, even virtually, uh, for what I know will be an evening of rich dialogue. Uh, I also want to just take a minute to thank Emily Nelson, uh, who is producing the event this evening, um, as well as Mary Allison Raper and Jonathan Yonan. And of course, um, Gil Greggs uh, for their work in curating and coordinating the speaker series um, that uh, sort of uh, serves as an unparalleled uh, resource for our, our learning community at St. David's. Our, our speaker series is designed to bring our students, in particular our seniors, um, into direct conversation with leaders in various fields, uh, from government and public service um, to the arts, journalism, uh, business and economics, and of course, higher ed. These leaders are uh, exemplars for our students, not just of uh, achievement and influence, uh, but of diligence, of courage, um, humble leadership, uh, and nuanced, careful thinking. Uh, not only do our students get to learn about these leaders, but through the speaker series, they have an opportunity to engage with them directly. And I know our students will take advantage of that opportunity tonight with Chancellor Guskowitz. Uh, the speaker series at its best also uh, aims to to, to carve out a space for robust and civil public discourse, uh, the kind that invites us uh, all to listen attentively, um, especially uh, to those who may challenge our presumptions and, and even to listen in a way that might cause our minds to be changed from time to time. Uh, a key priority of our work with students at St. David's is to equip them to think and to write and argue and listen um, and genuinely engage culture with, uh, with its, its dominant ideas and assumptions in a way that is discerning and winsome and articulate. Um, and I know that our students will have a chance to experience uh, that firsthand uh, from our speaker this evening. Um, and I'll also just say uh, that uh, none of our guests tonight need to feel in any way alienated um, due to the outcome of yesterday's Atlantic Coast Conference matchup. Um, we're all here together uh, for the students. So. Uh, without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Uh, Gil Greggs, who is um, our Director of Academic uh, Symposia and uh, our upper school, uh, one of our upper school um, history teachers. Dr. Greggs. Thank you, Matt. Welcome, everyone. We're so delighted that you could all uh, sign in and be with us. Let me begin with uh, just a few instructions. Uh, seniors and juniors should sign in in the chat uh, application so that we can take attendance. And... Uh, before I introduce the chancellor, I want to also thank uh, a number of people who've uh, made this possible tonight. First at Chapel Hill in the chancellor's office, Elizabeth Williams, an extraordinary uh, woman who's just been so helpful to me, I know over the years in uh, bringing to our campus a number of stars at the University of North Carolina. And uh, Chancellor Guskowitz is uh, another one tonight. And also along with Elizabeth Williams, uh, Lucy Dunderdale Kate, um, in the uh, tech department in the chancellor's office, who was enormously helpful. And as Matt said, on our end of the, of the, uh, of the meeting tonight, Mary Allison Raper, uh, Lee Stallings, uh, Emily Nelson, uh, who's producing tonight. I wanna begin by re uh, reading um, the bio or the introduction to our distinguished chancellor. And I'm gonna take my time with this because I think it's important that you hear uh, of the accomplishments that Kevin Guskowitz has has uh, already uh, achieved in his life. He's a neuroscientist, an academic leader, uh, a concussion researcher. He is the 12th chancellor of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a great university. Prior to his appointment as chancellor, uh, Dean Guskowitz served as the interim chancellor for a while from February of 2019 until December of 2019. And in that role, he held over 25 listening and learning sessions with constituents across the campus. He was instrumental in shaping Carolina's new st strategic plan called Carolina Next, Innovations for Public Good, that outlines a roadmap for the university's priorities as we move forward. He relaunched the Tar Heel bus tour with 90 faculty and campus leaders, demonstrating Carolina's commitment to the state 
As the Keenan Distinguished Professor of Exercise and Sports Science, he has been a member of Carolina's faculty since 1995. He is the co-director of the Matthew Feller Sports-Related Traumatic Brain Injury Research Center. Mr. Guskowitz is a nationally recognized expert on sport-related concussions. He maintains an active research portfolio and is the principal investigator or co-principal investigator on three active research grants that total over $20 million. His groundbreaking work has garnered numerous awards and has influenced concussion guidelines for the NCAA and the National Football League. Prior to his appointment as interim chancellor in February of 2019, uh, Chancellor Guskowitz had served as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Carolina's largest academic institution since January of 2016. It has more than 16,000 undergraduate students, 2,500 graduate students, and uh, the interdisciplinary teaching and research is a cornerstone of his tenure. He championed the use of high structure active learning techniques and Carolina is a national leader in implementing these highly effective educational strategies. He significantly increased study abroad, academic internships and other experimental learning opportunities for Carolina students. And he oversaw work on a major revamping of the University of North Carolina's general education curriculum. In 2011, Chancellor Guskowitz received the prestigious MacArthur Fellowship, often referred to in the media as the Genius Award, for his innovative work on the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of sports-related concussions. In 2013, Time Magazine named him a game changer, one of 18 innovators and problem solvers that are inspiring change in America. Kevin Guskowitz earned a Bachelor of Science degree in athletic training from Westchester University, a Master in Science in Exercise Physiology and Athletic Training from the University of Pittsburgh, and a PhD in Sports Medicine from the University of Virginia. He was born and raised in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. He lives with his wife, Amy, and their children, Jacob, Nathan, Adam, and Tessa in Chapel Hill. Please welcome, if you can, with a virtual clap, the Chancellor of the University of North Carolina, Kevin Guskowitz. Thank you, Dr. Griggs. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. Kevin, could you uh, begin, if, if I may ask, uh, with on a personal note, could you tell us a little bit about how it is that someone grows up in Western Pennsylvania and becomes a MacArthur Fellow and the Chancellor of the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill? Right. Well, uh, Thank you. That's, a, that's an interesting question and one that, uh, that I thought about recently as uh, I was just uh, officially installed as uh, Carolina's 12th chancellor two weeks ago today. And it was a special day for, for me and for my family. And uh, uh, we hold these um, installations of chancellors um, uh, on University Day, and, mm -hmm. which is the birthday of, of uh, Carolina back, going back to uh, 1793. And so we... Um, uh, when I, so I've given a lot of thought uh, of, of late to this a question similar to this. And you know, growing up in La Trobe, I was uh, always interested in sports. Uh, I was not uh, always wanted to be out on the football field, but it was uh, about 130 pounds uh, soaking wet. And so I was injured more than I was actually on the field. But I uh, had a passion for uh, being down on the field. And so I wanted to pursue a career in sports medicine. And I knew that at a fairly young age, uh, you know, my junior year in high school, and the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, trained in, um, and by the way, they're six and zero as of today. <laughs> and, um, and, and but they almost they barely uh, pulled that game out against the Titans today. But I um, I used to go up to St. Vincent College, uh, rode my bike up there as a kid to watch them uh, train in the summer because that's where they they had their training camp. And, uh, and then went on to Westchester, uh, had an opportunity to work uh, uh, both, uh, you know, with a number of the teams there off the University of Pittsburgh, which is really kind of right in our backyard there in Latrobe, and, um, and had an opportunity to work for the Pittsburgh Steelers. I, I became uh, an athletic trainer with them during um, uh, Chuck Knoll, who's a famous coach there. It's his last three seasons as the coach there for the Steelers. Yeah. And then on to UVA, uh, got my PhD there. And, and when I landed, I almost stayed at UVA as a faculty member there, but I had one last interview left that came down to Chapel Hill and fell in love with it. And I was offered the job and 
my, my wife was uh, not too excited about leaving Charlottesville. She loved it there. And, but uh, there was something, uh, something about uh, Chapel Hill that we just uh, re really, uh, some, something about it. Uh, and, and it was the people, I think, really, and uh, the opportunity to take on a leadership role at a fairly uh, early stage of my career. And so that's my advice. And I'll talk a little bit more, probably give some advice tonight. But I think taking on leadership roles uh, as early as you can in your career uh, is what uh, sort of put me on this trajectory to then become a department chair, a center director for our concussion work, uh, ultimately dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, and then when asked to step in as chancellor, uh, interim chancellor, I, uh, I, I said yes to that and uh, uh, really happy that I did. And uh, so that's sort of been my, my path, but it's been taking some chances um, um, but, you know, to, to, to lead, opportunities to lead and uh, to, to lead with, with a vision and, and boldness that I think is necessary uh, mm -hmm. to, to succeed. We want to come back to that uh, characteristic vision and boldness that you mentioned, because I noticed it when we spoke three years ago at that dinner uh, that I mentioned to you a little earlier. Uh, but let me begin by noting that one of the blessings of living in the triangle is being in the midst of three outstanding research universities. And they're all tremendous. I mean, I'm thinking of Carolina, of uh, uh, North Carolina State University under Randy Woodson and Duke University. And each is different in, in this way. But I must say that uh, the University of North Carolina, which is the oldest public university in America, is, is that right? Do I have that right? Correct. Uh, good. Well, uh, Joe Knott, one of our, our, our board chairman and a former uh, board of governor member, uh, likes to say that the, uh, the one thing that the state of North Carolina does exceedingly well is the university system. And I'm wondering about that. Could you, could you reflect with us a little bit on what is it in the history of the university that has made this university so outstanding? How is it that North Carolina pulled this off? I'll say that we are very fortunate to, to live in a state uh, where our, uh, our General Assembly, our, our, our uh, the citizens of North Carolina, our taxpayers, uh, support higher education and see the value of, uh, of top tier uh, public universities. And I want to say that you know, we're, UNC Chapel Hill is one of 17 uh, schools in that uh, public school system, higher ed system. Uh, and uh, each one of them brings something uh, unique uh, to the, the citizens of North Carolina and our, and our uh, rising generation. Um, as I uh, look, think back to that installation just two weeks ago, I talked about, uh, you know, looking back at our charter of the university from 1789 when the charter was, uh, was, was developed. Uh, and it talked about uh, consulting the happiness of a rising generation. And that's what I think we do. We, we are not only the first of the publics uh, in the nation, but I think we're the, uh, the most public of the publics. We're passionately public. We, everything that we do uh, is to serve um, the citizens of North Carolina and to, uh, whether it's through teaching, research, or service, it's, it's about uh, improving humankind. And if you look at the research uh, that our faculty conduct and the way that it impacts uh, those of us that live in this, this wonderful state, Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, uh, it's a great return on the investment uh, that the taxpayers and the General Assembly provide to make sure we have a top tier, one of the very best, if not the best, uh, higher ed systems in the country. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I wanted to, to mention that it so impressed me is the School of Government. I don't know of another university that has anything like this. Could you talk a little bit about that for a second? Yeah, so our School of Government, uh, it, you know, it... Um, was originally um, a, a program and uh, became a school uh, with, within the last 20 years. And uh, it uh, uh, does incredible work service, you know, it's research and service and, and everything from preparing and onboarding judges uh, that are uh, newly elected uh, to working for around new issues around economic development. Uh, you may know um, Anita Brown Graham is one of the incredible faculty members from the school. She's you'll see her on UNC TV with her NC Impact uh, program, where she's uh, you know interviewing um, uh, people across the state. Uh, she was a big uh, part of our uh, Tar Heel bus tour, uh, mm -hmm. as was Mike Smith, the dean of of the uh, School of Government, as we launched uh, a, a tour that Michael Hooker, uh, who right. was the who was the chancellor at Carolina when I got here in 1995, launched this bus tour to better educate the state about our faculty and better educate our faculty about the towns that our 
students call home. And so we uh, last October went back out on the road, traveled 1600 miles across the state for over three and a half days. And uh, so the School of Government is a big part of that in uh, showcasing the great work uh, that, that the university does for the state of North Carolina. Chancellor, uh, last spring, Randy Woodson joined us, the chancellor at NC State. And we had a very fascinating discussion about the fact that uh, the triangle is gonna double in population by 2040, roughly. And uh, what's not changing are the anchors of this culture, that is the three major universities. And as you draw up the master plan and think about the next 10 years, uh, how does that affect the way you think uh, Carolina, how does it affect its mission or, or does it at all with the doubling population? I like to tell my students, for example, that there are 80 new families moving into Wake County every day and they buy a house, but they don't bring one car, they bring four or three. So traffic in 20 years is gonna quadruple. We're gonna look like Boston. Uh, what, what role will Carolina have in planning and helping us through this enormous growth that's coming? Well, as, as the state of North Carolina expands, so does uh, uh, Carolina, uh, what Carolina needs to expand just as the state expands. And, uh, and it needs to better reflect the, the state of North Carolina, the demographics of the state of North Carolina. And uh, so I have recently announced uh, that we will uh, continue to increase in enrollment uh, over these next four years. Uh, the, uh, this incoming class uh, that just started this fall uh, was the largest class that we've ever had at Carolina. We're, we're actually teaching more students this fall uh, at UNC Chapel Hill than we ever have in the history of the university. Uh, despite the pandemic, uh, we have uh, been able to adapt and, and provide incredible opportunities and education for our uh, students. So we will continue to expand enrollment and we have to do this in, a, in unique ways. And I said that at the beginning of the pandemic that there would be three different types of universities that would emerge uh, from this pandemic. There would be uh, what I would call the stubborn university that would, they're, they're gonna try to go right back to doing things the way that they used to do them. Uh, there'd be, uh, the second type would be one that would probably learn a little bit from, the, from this sort of forced experiment that we all had to enter, right. uh, but, but quickly go back and revert back to doing business as usual, maybe change some things along the margins. But then there's going to be the reimagined university, and that's what Carolina will be. We, we have a new um, roadmap, uh, our, our it's a strategic plan called Carolina Next Innovations for Public Good. We have uh, we launched it in January, but we have already revised it. Uh, we've sort of covetized it, if you will. Uh, <laughs> but we are uh, preparing uh, to, to, you know, to, to produce the next uh, generation of leaders uh, across North Carolina, across the country. And that roadmap has eight strategic initiatives that we feel um, are really um, aligned with our priorities for, for, for the university, but they align beautifully with the needs of the state of North Carolina. And that roadmap is going to take us to great places. Chancellor, let me uh, draw the audience's attention to this. In a moment, we're going to open it up for questions and comments to our audience uh, for Chancellor Guskowitz. Uh, and I would like all the uh, everyone in the audience, not just the students, but all the parents, whoever is watching, to enter your question on the chat option. And Emily Nelson will, uh, will hand to me uh, the questions as they come in. And while we're letting people prepare for that, uh, let, me, let me continue the questioning by asking, uh, you mentioned the pandemic. Uh, we, we're certainly under this, uh, this effect. You know, it's been so difficult. It's changed the way we're doing the school year. Um, but I like to say, I was saying to my wife at dinner tonight, I always like to see a challenge as an opportunity uh, rather than complain. You know, there really is much to be discovered in any kind of challenge like this. What is it that, uh, what are the challenges that you've encountered with this uh, COVID problem? And uh, what are some of the blessings in some sense? What are some of the opportunities that, that you've been able to identify? Well, I think the obvious uh, challenge is that we know our students uh, thrive uh, uh, when they're here on, a, on our campus, living and learning and uh, interacting with one another, interacting with our world-class faculty and uh, having the opportunity to study abroad and uh, work alongside our world-class researchers in, in, in our research labs. And that just hasn't been possible uh, the, the, you know, over these past six or seven months. And so we are um, 
doing it. So that's probably the biggest challenge, but I, I couldn't agree more with you, uh, Dr. Graves, that, that on, on the other side of every challenge are multiple opportunities and that's what we're, uh, yeah. we're, we're trying to do. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I mentioned earlier, I think a silver lining, if you will, uh, of, of this has been a, a program called Carolina Away. It's a program that we had been talking about for two or three years, um, hadn't even really given it a name yet, but this is a program that is now serving uh, over 700 students and it'll likely serve closer to 1,000 students this coming spring uh, that provides an opportunity for 15 credit hours uh, in, in the semester, all virtual, but it provides, um, uh, we're, we're creating learning communities uh, for students that couldn't get to campus for this fall and who may not be able to get here next spring to still, we're, we're taking the campus to them virtually and uh, creating opportunities through student affairs to join clubs. Uh, it's, uh, we, we have a series of courses called COVID-19 investigations classes. Uh, we, uh, you may have seen back in April that uh, uh, Microsoft Analytics uh, ranked Carolina as the number one university in the country that was having an impact uh, through its research on uh, take, taking on and tackling the issues of the, uh, of the pandemic uh, of COVID-19. And so we're taking these investigations courses as opportunities to teach mm -hmm. students how to solve the grand challenges of our time and how to do this in an using an interdisciplinary approach where we bring the, uh, the natural sciences with the social sciences and the medical uh, allied health sciences, the humanities. And uh, so I've enjoyed getting into and you know, jumping into some of the classes with students and faculty to, to see uh, how they're uh, teaching through this new program called Carolina Way. Uh, it, that's one of the ways in which we're going to be able to, again, expand our enrollment uh, such that, that uh, we can uh, provide uh, access uh, to this incredible university uh, to more people. Chancellor, uh, any plan yet on uh, next semester on will students be able to come back on campus or where are we at Carolina with the uh, COVID protocols? So we just announced on Friday uh, campus message and then it went out to all the uh, students and parents uh, of the university that we will um, uh, bring students back to live and learn on campus uh, into our residence halls uh, in a, a reduced manner. Uh, about 3,500 students is the plan right now. Uh, we will have single occupancy in those residence halls. Uh, we will uh, again uh, have in-person classes uh, a combination of in-person and remote uh, as we started off this semester. Uh, we've been learning a lot from this experience. We've learned from our experiences through our reopening uh, back in August, uh, late in July and August. Uh, we've learned uh, as we've watched other universities around the country and what's worked for them and what's not worked. Uh, we will have a more robust testing program, uh, mm. re-entry testing. And um, so we, we are uh, excited about this, but yet, uh, as you all well know, uh, we'll, we'll need to watch the path of this virus uh, and be prepared, uh, you know, as we as we move into early January to see, um, you know, what what is possible. But that is the plan right now, and, and I'm optimistic that we'll have a successful start uh, to the to that spring semester. Have the professional schools uh, been holding classes? I don't know the law school, the dental school, the medical school. They've been on campus. So it's been a, it's been a combination, right? Right, right now, all of our undergraduate courses are being taught remotely. Uh, although there are students on campus, our libraries are open, the student stores, the student union. Uh, we're having some recitations for students that are still living in the area. We still have over ten thousand students living in uh, the surrounding area within about a mile and a half, two miles of campus, and about fifteen hundred students living in our uh, residence halls. Uh, you know, today as, as, as we sit here. Uh, but our graduate programs are, uh, many of those classes are being taught in person and our research labs are open. And uh, we're having an incredible year with research. Uh, we're, Great. we're Great. about 15% ahead of where we were last year at this time. <laughs> That's terrific. Chancellor, I wanted to ask you about some recent trends in education um, that have come. In the last, I think, 13 years, I, I, I may be wrong about it, maybe 14, but every year for the last 13 or 14 years, uh, undergraduate enrollment across the nation among men has declined. Uh, any thoughts about why that is? Well, I think, you know, right now, uh, in fact, the study that just came out last week from the Higher Education Clearinghouse uh, showed that six, six higher ed in general is down, uh, undergraduate enrollment is down 16% uh, this um, at this point for, uh, relative to where it was last year. Last year, it was down about 4% from the year before. And uh, we know that there are more uh, women applying uh, to, uh, to college than, than men uh, today relative to where we were uh, just a decade ago, even five years ago. 
And, um, uh, and, and I don't know, I think we're seeing more men taking gap years, uh, taking a little time to, um, you know, to, to be sure that college is the right fit for them or to, uh, what, what they may want to uh, pursue in terms of a, a, a career or major. But um, we, you know, Carolina, we have been uh, at about a 60-40% ratio over the past four to five years in terms of women to men uh, that, that, uh, that we enroll here. And so that, that trend, and that is a national trend. So I, I don't have a good answer for, yeah. for, uh, for you other than to say that I think that what we are seeing men take uh, more time to, to think through and, and prepare for uh, uh, applying to college. Chancellor, one of our students has, uh, the questions are starting to come in and I wanna encourage everyone to ask a question uh, via the chat option and uh, Emily Nelson will hand me the questions. And Wade Farrell, one of our seniors, uh, wants to know what you think about this. Has, has the COVID-19 pandemic changed higher education, residential college life forever? Or will we return to some kind of new normal or old normal? Uh, great question. I, I believe we will uh, return more, uh, you know, to, to sort of a residential learning. Uh, but I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think the Reimagine University is going to see that that it can, in fact, uh, universities can, in fact, deliver uh, high quality uh, instruction uh, remotely, and it yeah. will provide better access. Um, uh, and, and opportunities for students, even who may want to take the first year uh, for, for whatever reason, um, mm -hmm. uh, remotely not living residentially, and then to uh, you know, migrate back in, into a residential uh, learning environment. Uh, I, I personally believe that, uh, that students over the course of a four year, um, four years to, to earn a degree uh, will thrive best, will we'll have the opportunities if they're here on, on a campus with the resources that we have. But I do think uh, that a semester or two studying through a Carolina Way program or uh, taking courses remotely, um, we're, we're seeing that it can can be done effectively. But I think you know, we'll back to a more residential program. Clay Matthews, another one of our seniors, uh, a talented lacrosse player who you may see at Carolina at some time. Uh, Clay was asking me uh, just now, will, will some undergraduate colleges not make it through this? That is the the effect, Carolina is, a, is blessed with a big endowment, uh, tremendous public support, a state legislature that's very proud of it. But what about the small liberal arts college with, uh, with less endowments, you know, Guilford College, uh, I'm just thinking about, or Davidson College, which is well endowed. Uh, will we see changes there, do you think? I, I do worry about it. Uh, you know, we're fortunate, even though enrollments are down uh, nationally, as I said, 16% uh, uh, this fall, uh, we're fortunate, Carolina, we're actually up 1%. I mentioned that this is the largest incoming class we've ever had and will continue to grow. Um, I, I think one of the things that, that, that makes us unique is that we are, you know, every year for the past 20 years, Kiplinger's has uh, ranked Carolina as the uh, best buy in America. So top right. quality for the best dollar, you know, in terms of affordability. And, uh, and I think that's uh, a credit to, uh, you know, our... Uh, General Assembly, legislature, board of governors over the years that have said that that's important to us to be sure that we can provide a high quality, affordable education. I think that's one of the things that will keep uh, the publics like Carolina and NC State and uh, ECU and others, um, uh, you know, thriving. I do worry about uh, the small privates. Uh, if enrollment uh, continues to decline, they can't uh, lean on state appropriation uh, to, to help support them. Uh, and uh, to handle a shortfall with uh, tuition dollars in the way that uh, that we can in a higher in our system of, of higher uh, public education. We have questions rolling in now, Chancellor. Uh, another one is, uh, what advice do you have uh, for a young undergraduate or senior in high school who's uncertain about what they want to do in life? Should they go off to college knowing full well what they want to do, or is there some virtue in not knowing? You know, I'm a big uh, believer in exploration and people explore in different ways. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, those that choose to come to a place like Carolina, one of the things that I uh, am most proud of here is that we we do not require our students to choose a major in their first or second semester. In fact, uh, uh, my son, uh, who's a junior economics major with a minor in statistics right now, at Carolina uh, chose his major in his, uh, his second semester, sophomore year. And, 
and he because he took his time to figure the, out what he wanted to do and I so I, I I'm a big fan of if you think you're going to go to you know want to go to college and you've um, you've been a high achiever in, in high school uh, I'm not a big fan of the gap year uh, come and explore pick a school where you can explore um, mm -hmm. having said that if if you're not sure that uh, the college is right and you're in you're maybe not sure about a school that's going to allow you to explore if you're you know you've been accepted to places where you have to choose early on and you're having some doubt maybe that's the time for a gap year to go off and explore mm -hmm. uh, in a different way outside of a college experience you know chancellor uh holden I thorpe came. Thing about that yeah go ahead before i forget i, I wanted to mention uh, i also encourage students to uh, to do everything possible to to when you do select a degree uh, program and a major to, to think about at least a minor uh, uh, in an unrelated field or uh, a double major. Uh, Carolina, we uh, graduate more double majors or, or uh, may, uh, students would have a major with a minor than just about any of our uh, peer institutions. And that's another mm -hmm. thing that I'm proud of. And I think in this world that we live in, we've got to prepare our, our students to have uh, breadth across a variety of, of areas, uh, depth within a chosen discipline. And then there's the practice part. So undergraduate research, uh, study abroad, internship. So uh, that's been a big part of our new gen ed curriculum that you mentioned earlier. It's breadth, depth, and practice. Mm -hmm. And uh, being prepared uh, in five, 10 years down the road after you graduate to, to maybe have to pivot and uh, into another right. area and to have that breadth across different areas, uh, I think is a, is a real bonus. Holden Thorpe was, uh, was in our seminar a few years ago, uh, five or six. And um, Holden always had this amazing kind of advice, whether he was giving a commencement address, you know, based on Beatle title songs. Uh, uh, he was really wonderful at it, but he actually gave a really wonderful pitch for failure. He said that we don't honor failure enough. That is that uh, there has to be a place for trying something and discovering that maybe you, it's not your strength or trying something and failing and trying again. He had uh, a colleague in the medical school, you know, Holden's a chemist, as you know, and uh, someone had uh, tried for a grant for 11 straight years and been turned down from the NIH. But on his 12th year, he was granted $4 million grant. And Holden was just saying he could have quit. You know, he could have decided that somehow he wasn't. But the, the beauty of failure, the importance of failure, in, especially in undergraduate education, is important. Our questions are rolling in now. Um, let me go I on with it anymore. Holden's a good friend and uh, and an entrepreneur, and he, he would tell yep. you that as an entrepreneur, you have to you have to learn to fail, but just fail, learn to fail fast so that you can move on and pivot <laughs> to that next thing. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Don't dwell on it, but keep going. We hope to have him back soon. You know, he's a, he's he's the editor at Science now. As you he know. just guest lectured in my class. Uh, I teach a, a graduate class, uh, and he guest lectured for me about three weeks ago. And he's uh, he's incredible. Yeah, he is a great guy. Uh, some questions are pouring in now in, in this way. Uh, how soon do you think study abroad will be reinstituted among universities, Carolina, but other places as well? Yeah, we're working really hard, uh, uh, obviously, to try to, you know, the, the biggest issue is obviously making sure that uh, that it's safe in the region of the world that, uh, that we're gonna set up a program and that we can ensure safe travel uh, and then uh, accommodations for our students once they're there. Uh, we had just a few programs that were able to run this, this fall. And uh, we'll, we'll have a few more in the spring, uh, but uh, we're working hard, uh, certainly by next fall. A lot of this, you know, people are saying, well, it's going to depend on the vaccine and when that vaccine is going to be, uh, you know, approved or multiple vaccines and then widely distributed. But uh, uh, our, our, we'll have a few more programs running this spring and, and hopefully uh, a full slate next fall. One of our students is asking, uh, have you run into any difficulty with virtual classes? That is things you hadn't thought about, uh, but that popped up once the virtual class program had begun. Well, I think the challenge that we're the, that we're faced with right now is trying to identify if a class is going to be taught virtually, uh, and it's a large lecture class. Uh, I know that some faculty are saying that they they're having a hard time, uh, especially in an asynchronous format. Uh, knowing if the students are capturing it and, and, and uh, you yeah, know, right. learning the material beyond just the exams, because it's one thing to stand in front of a classroom and you can look out to your class of, of 45, 55 students right. and see that uh, who's kind of getting it and who's not. 
and it's a little harder to do, uh, a lot harder to do, we think this way. So we're beginning to set up, um, you know, more recitation sessions uh, mm -hmm. through smaller virtual settings, uh, through our, with our teaching assistants. Uh, if it's a larger class, you know, more than 65 students, for those smaller set classes, faculty are, are really um, working hard to. to uh, be sure that students attend office hours. And I'll say this, uh, both faculty and students have shared with me that uh, if the Zoom, if there's one thing that the Zoom format um, it, it may, maybe is here to stay with, it's the office hours. Uh, mm -hmm. Rather than having a line of students sitting outside your office not right. knowing when they're going to get in, uh, to be able to schedule a 20 or 30 minute session with mm -hmm. your faculty member and you get them one on one right here in the Zoom screen, uh, it seems to be working really well. Yeah, that's that's certainly right. Uh, we found that too, by the way, that um, the advantages of this. We can even get speakers, for example, uh, on Zoom, you know, that we couldn't ever bring to campus because it would be too expensive and yes. uh, and we're hard at work on that. Another question that we had, two more that have just come in. Uh, I hope I have this right. Do you see uh, the advances in technology and the, er the erosion of privacy uh, having an effect on the curriculum in the undergraduate college as you go forward? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And I uh, not thought of it. I mean, we are um, uh, one, one of the, and, and is the question geared more toward um, sort of in teaching in this with technology? And right. Teaching yeah, that's right. That is as the, as teaching becomes more technological, I think is the question. How does that affect uh, the construction of courses and so on? Sure. I mean, I think it, where it's become really difficult have been in our laboratory science classes. We've had to convert those labs, yeah. which are technically very uh, hands-on, uh, and now we're needing to demonstrate them through, uh, you know, online uh, sort of tutorials, and and uh, that that's that's been a challenge. But I I think the the actual instruction part, the, the advanced technology part of it is going to be, you know, who owns the material because we're recording all of these and. Uh, how uh, you know faculty want to be sure that they're retaining the rights to their uh, intellectual property with, with their course class materials. So I think that's something we're going to have to, as the technology continues to improve and the dissemination of that material can become a lot easier to do and uh, and then uh, retaining the, the rights to it is, is a challenge. So there will be a lot I think that we'll learn from this as we move forward. Chancellor, uh, another question has, has come. Um, has the pandemic affected uh, the university investments in any way? And let me add, as you answer that question, that it is a public university, but a big part of it is a uh, private endowment with lots of generous giving from people. But let me ask it this way, how, how public is Carolina these days? And uh, what effect will the pandemic have upon the investment portfolio? Yeah, so uh, as I said earlier, we're very fortunate to be supported uh, uh, by uh, the General Assembly and our taxpayers here in North Carolina. But our entire uh, operating budget, which is about $3.3 billion a year, uh, it's only about 16, 17% of that is actually covered through state appropriation. Right. But that is much higher than most of our public peers. I mean, Virginia, UVA is an example is about 7%. So wow. less than half of what uh, our, in terms of percentage uh, of overall um, commitment from the state toward that operating budget comes, uh, you know, from the state. So uh, a large part of it uh, is obviously our research uh, uh, portfolio. We're about a 1.1, $1.2 billion in research that, uh, dollars that, that help support the university. Uh, tuition dollars are in the neighborhood of about 430, 440 million. And so, um, I, you know, I think where we're being hit uh, the hardest right now uh, are in our auxiliary unit. So, uh, athletics is certainly taking, uh, right. you know, a, a hit. Uh, housing, dining, parking. Uh, these, uh, given that we have a, a very limited number of students living and learning on campus, uh, that's where we we're struggling the most right now financially. But the fact that enrollment is up, uh, that's a good sign. And and I'll just add that while our endowment uh, has continued to do uh, very well, we like most people's. Uh, um, investments. Uh, we had a rough uh, month and a half, two months back in uh, March and April, but the things uh, for the most part rebounded. And um, the, the challenge though is we have a lot of people that think that we can, during a, a pandemic and a projected shortfall, we can just dip into our endowment. 90% uh, of our endowment is restricted. Right. right. You know, 
Right, and right. so uh, we are spending wisely that roughly nine to ten percent that uh, that's not restricted, uh, and uh, given that we've continued to have a, a a good year overall. Chancellor, we've gotten a few questions, and you may want to say a little bit more about uh, about this. Your your research with concussions. Uh, could you do one of two things here? Tell us a little bit about the MacArthur uh, Fellowship and the foundation, and then uh, the question that we that we're getting from. Um, uh, uh, from the chat room is, would you let your children, do you let your children play sports where head injury is likely? And another part, this is three questions. It, does the NFL have a future? Yeah, great questions. Let me tell you a real quick fun story about the MacArthur. So what you may know is that you, um, when you um, receive this, it, it always happens every September, October, they uh, announce about tw between 20 and 24 uh, winners of the MacArthur Fellowship. It just happened recently. And fortunately, right. one of our faculty members uh, received one and she's right. only the second person uh, at Carolina uh, to have received one. And so I was thrilled. Uh, we, um, and it's Professor Cotton from the uh, sociology department, right. but I was away at a medical meeting and uh, you may have heard that you get an out of the blue phone call. And uh, <laughs> so I was started to get text messages from a number that I didn't recognize. And then I started getting emails uh, from an individual and it said at Mac Foundation. It was at, you know, it was the the, um, the end of the email. And finally I called the number back and uh, it was the head of the MacArthur Foundation. And he said, uh, are you in a private place? And I said, well, uh, no, I'm standing in a hotel lobby about to take a shuttle bus to the airport. I was in Minneapolis and uh, at this medical meeting. And uh, he said, well, can you get to a private place? And so I looked around and the closest thing I could find was a restroom. So I went in there. And so I stood in the in the men's room uh, with my cell phone to my ear uh, to be told that I had just won. I got your MacArthur Fellow. MacArthur Fellow, it was pretty special. And I, I quickly jumped out of that restroom and, and you're not allowed to tell anybody. It's a, <laughs> and they, they keep, you know, uh, swear you to secrecy. I was, out of, I was able to tell my wife uh, and he had to keep that a secret for about two weeks. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, it was really based around uh, some of the really important work that we were doing here at Carolina to develop um, tools for assessing concussion. And I, uh, as we often talked about, is that the management of concussion, it was, it, was, it was like a lot of guesswork involved. We didn't have really good co cognitive tests, balance tests uh, uh, to, uh, to be sure that an athlete uh, was ready to go back to, to play safely. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of our work focused on during my first uh, 10 uh, years here at Carolina, uh, surrounded by a great research team is really what allowed us to, to receive a MacArthur Award. Um, I have allowed my kids to play sports, but I will tell you that as I would stand up on the hill watching football practice with my middle school and high school kids down there playing, the coaches, I think were pretty nervous. Um, but uh, I uh, always made sure and, and I enjoyed uh participating in helping uh, teams here in the Chapel Hill area, be sure that they had the right protocols in place and, and, and that the equipment was, uh, you know, up to, to, to speed, you know, the best equipment that we could possibly have to protect our kids. And but more important than that is just the, the techniques that were being taught. And a lot of our work over the years has shifted more toward uh, behavior modification. We have a, a large project that involved many high schools in the local, uh, in, in the area here, where we were trying to, you know, just work to modify behavior out on the playing field in, in football, soccer, lacrosse, uh, right. to be sure that, uh, that our ath young athletes could keep themselves safe and protect themselves. Um, and then I think the last qu question uh, was around uh, whether or not there's a, the NFL has a future, right? Right. You know, I, I will say that um, I think that uh, Roger Goodell, the uh, you know the commissioner, uh, his legacy, I think at the end uh, when he retires will end up being you know the health and safety of the athletes. I know he's uh, taken some criticism for that at times uh, that uh, uh, you know too many rules changes and too many penalties for uh, you know trying to uh, you know penalize players for uh, leading with the head. And but I think that was uh, necessary to help uh, probably save the sport. And so. I do think uh, it, 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 well, it's here to stay, I, I believe, but I do think it's a safer game today than it was uh, just a decade ago, certainly more than it was two decades ago. And I'm proud of the fact that uh, science has helped uh, uh, drive change in the NFL and, and sport in general to make it safer. 
You mentioned a very, I think, uh, important note there that the, the ethos of football has changed. You know, that when I was a kid, uh, John Unitas never ran out of bounds, the quarterback for the Baltimore Colts, because his manhood would have been called into question. Now, of course, that's uh, advice and quarterbacks can slide and uh, the hitting has changed. So uh, it does look as though it does have a future. It's just going to be a very different game. And Chancellor, two things on that. Uh, one is, is it true that on the MacArthur Fellowship that the, nomin the persons doing the nominating are unknown and invisible? So you have no idea who, who nominated you? I have no idea who nominated me. Uh, I, I know they told me that there were 22,000 nominations that year. Right. They got it down to 2,200 uh, that they then went through an extensive process and then they got it down to 22. So I, I have to tell you, I felt extremely honored. And, uh, uh, it, and as I said, it was a special time for, for, for me, my family, and but really for my research team and, and the university. And uh, it seems like it was just yesterday, but hard to, it's hard to believe it's been almost, uh, uh, well, it's nine years ago here. Just 2011. Yeah. 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 Chancellor, we've had uh, a Nobel Prize winner come to St. David's in the speaker series, and now we have a MacArthur Fellow. And they're both from Carolina. Oliver Smithies uh, came through a few, a few years ago. It was just a really charming guy. Let me follow up that last question about some advice for um, uh, parents with young children playing those contact sports. Is, is there an age that you recommend that they wait until they uh, can start playing such sports? Is football really best now left to high school or can you play in middle school? Or what about soccer and heading the ball and so on? Yeah, great questions. And I, you know, I always tell parents and I've advised a lot of parents over the years on questions like this. That I think they have to be individual uh, decisions. I don't, you know, there's, uh, I have three, uh, three sons and a daughter, and I could tell you that all three of those, uh, the, my boys, they, uh, at age 12, 13, they each uh, look different, their physique, their, mm -hmm. uh, even their, the anxiety that they had of, about sport, you know, one of them was pretty aggressive, another one was a little more reserved, and I, I knew that would probably end up being injured if he were out, out there, um, but I, I believe in having good conversations with, uh, with, with kids before they make these decisions. Uh, I worry a little bit uh, about, you know, there was a lot of talk of just banning uh, youth football before the age of 15. And mm -hmm. some states actually have gotten pretty close to, to that. Uh, I often, uh, we, and we've done some research to look at this, that if you put football pads on for the first time, uh, or had a soccer ball for the first time when you're 15 and you haven't developed the skill technique right. against um, athletes that are of the same size and, and uh, skill level uh, at a younger age, uh, that you might be more at risk for a serious mm -hmm. injury whenever there aren't um, protocols in place to, uh, to, to uh, make sure that you're playing against the same size individual or the same skill level uh, athlete. So I, I, that's sort of been my take over the years is that um, I don't, I don't, I'm not a fan of uh, putting kids in football pads at, at age seven or eight for sure. Um, but I think somewhere, uh, you know, based on, uh, you know, the, that individual uh, to probably start to learn if you're going to play in high school at, at age 11 or 12 uh, is, is probably okay. Yeah. And it's the skills that are important to develop the skills right. as you go along. Uh, Chancellor, you've, you've been to St. David's before with Bob and Alana Condor to help us yes, establish right. a baseline. Um, and we've had a number of, of our athletes who've had several concussions, and these questions are coming from them. How many concussions in a year uh, can a student athlete safely survive? Yeah. Well, uh, I tell people that concussions are like snowflakes. Uh, there's no two alike. And so uh, it's really hard to put a number on them. Uh, there's a lot of factors. I just advised a, a family on this uh, 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 earlier this week on, on uh, Tuesday, this past week. Uh, I think that the, the, the su succession of the time between successive concussions is import an important factor. Uh, so somebody that's had four concussions spread out over six or seven years is uh, likely not nearly as uh, problematic as somebody that's had four concussions uh, mm -hmm. over a uh, an 18 month period that that's a case where I would say, okay, it's probably time to hang it up. Um, and, and, and also the duration of symptoms for that concussion uh, is really important to, to understand and to track that uh, to, to define the seriousness of it and, and to help guide the decision about whether or not uh, 
uh, it, it's maybe time to, uh, to, to change sports. Let me uh, address this to our audience, just to note that we have about 10 more minutes uh, left in the evening with the chancellor. So if you have some questions, uh, please enter them in chat or email them to me and I'll be able to submit them. And uh, Chancellor, can we return just for a second to, uh, to the College of Arts and Sciences and yeah. ask, um, uh, well, how to put this? Every year there's some new program that I have to learn, uh, some new computer program, some new grade recording program. And uh, as I get older, I find that I miss the reliability of habit, the wisdom of not having to, to change or, or even to stay with something inefficient just because we all know it. How fast are things changing in the uh, College of Arts and Sciences or the University General? Is, is there a kind of speed that's hard to keep up with uh, for your faculty? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I love about uh, the College of Arts and Sciences, and, and I was dean for three years, senior associate dean for uh, the natural sciences for three years, uh, uh, is that um, we are finding more ways every day to collaborate. Uh, when I was dean, we uh, our strategic plan that we built uh, for the college, uh, uh, we developed a new uh, mission statement for the college. I We had a mission statement that was about eight or 10 sentences long. And I said, you know, the, the dean has to at least be able to uh, state the mission statement of the college. And so we went, th we went through a process and came up with a one that I today uh, still uh, can recite back to you on. It's, it's think, communicate, collaborate, create for meaningful lives. That's think, That's great. collaborate, create for meaningful lives. And I think those four things we uh, do very well. And I think the, what's changing is that the, to, to take on and, and solve the grand challenges of our time or prepare our students to be able to uh, identify and think about what the grand challenges of tomorrow are going to be, you have to be able to do all those things. So you have to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the collaboration is so important. It's why I talked earlier about the breadth across disciplines. And I think our faculty are, uh, are, are adapting and changing. I've seen this over the past decade, right. finding ways to work across those disciplines. They're not working in silos. I think that's been the greatest change mm -hmm. that I've seen. Uh, I, um, I think when we do that, we are uh, prepared, better prepared to teach our students how to think and not what to think. Uh, and you mentioned earlier uh, in the introduction about the importance of um, uh, of civil uh, discourse, maybe Matt mentioned this, about uh, having a discourse and, and civil discourse and right. Uh, and uh, a willingness to listen and uh, to understand another person's point of view. And we have a new program at Carolina called the Program for Public Discourse. And we've had incredible mm -hmm. programming around this uh, that I think um, I I'm really proud of. And I think it's, uh, that that's a change that we've seen uh, that's been needed. I'm glad to hear that. This is the university that had Bill Friday for so long, who defended freedom of speech and the importance of exchanging ideas and creating a space on campus where people can think and discuss. We're a big believer in that here in the senior seminar that civil discourse is uh, crucial to a democratic republic in order to settle uh, political problems. And we, we believe in that. Good. We're a school uh, chancellor that still teaches Latin and Greek. And, um, and I think we still require it in the seventh grade. We, we uh, you know, it starts early. Um, what role is there for the uh, classics and the humanities in this increasingly technological and specialized culture? Is there still a place for Plato and Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas and Augustine and Hobbes and Kant? Uh, or, or are we being, are we old fashioned in this light? No, I, I am a big uh, proponent of it. I, again, I think it goes back to what I said earlier. It's this bridging of the humanities uh, with the social sciences and the natural sciences. One of our um, fastest growing programs at Carolina in the College of Arts and Sciences is, is called PP&E. And it's mm. philosophy, politics, and economics. Economic. And it's the bridging of these three disciplines and bringing uh, you know, philosophy and, and uh, classics into the discussions around uh, better understanding the economy and, uh, uh, and the way politics intersects with, with, uh, with all of this. And so uh, I do believe that, um, uh, that that's important. I uh, took part before when I was back before I became dean. Actually, I was senior associate dean in uh, something called the Lincoln Project that we had here at Carolina, and it brought uh, leaders to to campus for a two day uh, workshop. And 
uh, we had uh, some members of the General Assembly. We had uh, several deans on our campus, a few university presidents from other uh, universities. Randy Woodson was there. It's the first time I met Randy, actually, and Carol Folt uh, hosted mm -hmm. it. Uh, and we had some industry leaders and something that stuck with me, uh, Tom Marsico, uh, who, um, uh, whose children went to Carolina, but he's a venture capitalist. He, he has probably started 70, 80 companies in his lifetime. And he said that he uh, always hires people with liberal arts degrees, regardless of whether it's a high tech company or whether it's okay. a, um, you know, something in the, the medical field, um, uh, because uh, of their ability to, uh, to think uh, uh, creatively and, and to, to write and to bring these different uh, perspectives to the, to the discussion and, and really to lead in, in, in an important way. So uh, that's always stuck with me. And I think that's one of the things that we do really well here at Carolina. I'm glad to hear that. We had uh, Congressman David Price in the seminar several times in the last couple of years. And one of the things we asked David is, uh, what's the most important thing that you look for when you're hiring somebody? And he said to us, teach your students to write. We can teach them anything else, but if they can't write, we can't hire them. Right. And so at St. David's, we put a big emphasis on learning how to think and learning how to write and how the two go together. And uh, we're certainly committed to that. And I'm glad to hear that you see a role for that. Uh, Chancellor, just a one, one or two more questions and then we'll wrap it up for this evening. But uh, what are the challenges in maintaining the excellence as the university goes forward? What are, what are the three biggest problems you have to solve? Well, we obviously uh, have to get beyond the, uh, the the pandemic and try to be sure that we are providing the flexibility uh, and, and options for our, our students, faculty, and staff to be able to uh, work under the conditions that we've been uh, faced with. And certainly, it's uh, you know even rolling into the spring semester, it'll be uh, still going to be a challenge for us, but we're going to you know work hard to provide that uh, those as many options for people to be able to thrive in, in the environment here at Carolina. Uh, and uh, so th there's that. There's the financial component of it. I mean, I uh, you know uh, higher education in general is facing uh, potentially facing historic losses in in uh, in revenue. Uh, but we have to be uh, prepared for uh, what that may look like as a state institution. Uh, certainly, we are. Um, uh, we have to be concerned and worried about what uh, that state appropriation might or might not look like uh, as we, you know, come to the uh, the end of 21, 2021 in June at the end of that fiscal year. So uh, those are the challenges I think that we have. And then I think it's just making sure that, you know, the, the last thing I'll say, there's a lot of mental health challenges for, mm -hmm. for students, not just at the uh, uh, yeah. collegiate level, but certainly at the high school level and the middle schools. And we have to be sure we're taking care of our of our students and, uh, and our children because uh, this isolation that the pandemic has created uh, is, is a challenge. And it's one of the reasons why we're doing everything we can to try to bring students back to campus who, who can get here and that we can be ensure a safe learning environment for. Councillor, one of the things I ask my students in every class that I teach, and usually that's the senior seminar, which is about philosophy. And I also teach economics. Uh, but the question is this, what's the most interesting thing you've read in the last six or seven months? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will admit that I, I have a habit of starting. I have a book on my <laughs> nightstand. I have a book on my desk here. I have a book, of, uh, you know, a desk at work that I, <laughs> so I'm like at any given time, I'm reading three books at one time and I'd be probably better off if I finished one of them and then moved on to the next one. But uh, <laughs> um, the one on my desk here is called Deep Work. Uh, it's by Cal Newport, uh, professor from MIT. Uh, and it's, um, the subtitle is uh, uh, Rules for uh, focused success in a distracted world. Oh wow! And it's uh, it's I'm about three quarters of the way finished. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I was gonna finish it this weekend. I didn't quite get there, but uh, it it sort of talks about uh, the how social media and email and the internet uh, has become such a distraction for us. Oh, yeah. to complete anything. It's probably one of the reasons why I haven't completed the book. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> but um, uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, but uh, I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan. Uh, mm -hmm. I've uh, read uh, almost all of his uh, uh, books and, uh, and was fortunate enough to be interviewed by, by Malcolm Gladwell about oh, wow. years ago. And we were featured in a, uh, one of his uh, Atlantic uh, Magazine uh, article, articles. So that was fun. Say, say a little bit more about that. Uh, Blink is one of my favorite books that he wrote. 
Yeah. yeah. What was the interview about? It's a great one. Uh, he was doing a piece uh, and it was interesting because I was just about finished reading Outliers and I got this email. It was a Sunday night just like this and I'm sitting there uh, and, and an email comes up from Malcolm Gladwell and I'm like, okay, this has got to be a joke. This can't be. <laughs> there must be another Malcolm Gladwell. Uh, but, uh, but he was doing a piece on, um, um, on brain trauma and, uh, and he came at it from a number of different angles from a uh, looking at uh, the military, uh, you know, having challenges in this area to professional athletes. And um, and so he asked if he could come to campus like in three days. And I'm like, in three days? Like, sure. So he came and spent most of a day with us, uh, uh, interviewed me and my research team, uh, spent some time with our football coach. And uh, it, it was fun. And uh, but that's probably been it's been at least it's probably been eight years ago now as I'm sitting here thinking about it. So that's amazing. We're coming near the end of the hour, uh, Chancellor. And before I, I give you a sincere and honest thanks here, I want to I want to remind everybody of the upcoming events that we have. So this coming Thursday, for example, your son may be interested in this. We have two officers of the Federal Reserve making a virtual visit to our AP economics classes. Uh, Matthew Martin, who's chair of the Charlotte uh, Fed in the fifth district. And Sefi Saidi, uh, who is a CEO of a consulting firm here in Raleigh, will be with us at 12.30 on Thursday. And uh, we'll be in the PAC, the Performing Arts Center for that. Everyone's welcome. And then let me remind you, everyone, that on uh, November the 15th, uh, Chancellor, you're invited to join us if you like. Uh, we have a panel discussion on the place of the humanities in a democratic republic. And uh, that's anchored by uh, Robert Newman, you may know from the National Humanities Center. Robert's the CEO there. Uh, Sandy McDonald, the CEO of the North Carolina Symphony. And Valerie Hillings, who's the president of the North Carolina Museum of Art. And Dr. Mamandi, uh, who has given generously to all three of those institutions and yours as well. Uh, that'll be on uh, November the 11th. Then in January, Peter Hans is coming. Uh, to visit with us. Uh, we don't know if that'll be virtual or not. It may be, it may be in fact, uh, on campus. We certainly hope so. But everyone, I want to, um, I want to, uh, want you all to join me in thanking uh, Chancellor Guskowitz for giving up an hour on a Sunday night uh, to come and uh, be with us and answer all these questions and give us a sense. And uh, Chancellor, uh, I usually end something like this. We're going to have Matt give a prayer here and a blessing in a moment. But I want to end by inviting you back, uh, if I may be so bold to do so. And uh, frankly, Randy Woodson and I were talking about this. We'd like to get you together with uh, maybe the president of Duke and, uh, and Connie Book from Elon, who was here last year for an interesting panel discussion. We want to do that next year when we can be on campus and together uh, in, in a more uh, convivial setting than this one. So let me thank you so very much uh, for the generous time that you've given us tonight. Thank and you. let me turn it uh, back over to Matt, who will bring us to an end. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you, uh, Dr. Greggs, and uh, thank you, Chancellor, uh, so much. What a treat it was for us to hear from you. Um, and uh, thank you to our, our guests and our students for your active participation tonight. Um, Chancellor, you, you um, probably can understand that as a school, a school like ours, you know, we, um, we send our students when they graduate to uh, schools all over the country. Um, and um, of course, one of those is uh, Carolina. And so we think of this as sort of a sacred partnership. We, uh, we shepherd uh, our students um, and, and care for them and invest in them. And then we send them off. And uh, we, uh, we, we would just love to end the evening uh, with a prayer, if it's okay with you, um, for you and your leadership and your institution um, as we continue in this, uh, what we really do genuinely consider as a sacred partnership with the schools that we send our students out to. So um, if I could just invite us all to, um, uh, to pray together. Our, our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you for uh, the Chancellor and for his time. Uh, thank you for the good work they're doing at Carolina. Thank you for his good leadership. We lift it, him to you and we lift uh, the, the school to you and all of our students who are there currently um, and all of our students who, have, um, who are uh, aspiring to be there on their way there. Uh, we lift uh, all, all of this to you and are grateful, Lord, to you for guiding our paths, guiding their paths. 
um, and even in this time of uncertainty. We thank you for this evening. Thank you for what we've had to learn from uh, Chancellor Guskowitz. And um, we uh, uh, thank you and uh, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank, thank you, so you everyone. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, and we, uh, we wish you all a, a good night.